later, the coffee, croissant, pan au chocolat, and are ready to hear about a new exciting program, the Global Cultural Leadership Program. We need leaders if we are going to meet all of those objectives uh, that have been set for 20 years in protecting cultural heritage. And Sana Utashi, who is the leader of, the team leader of the cultural diplomacy platform, is going to talk to you about this initiative with two of the participants of this program. Sana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Do you hear me? Yes? It works. So, thank you very much and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, as I have a mic for a couple of minutes, I take the opportunity to warmly welcome all of you and thank you very much for being here uh, today on behalf of the Cultural Diplomacy Platform, its members, its team and also all its uh, partners here in Brussels and somewhere else. So I, I believe the discussions we had already this morning are quite uh, interesting. I'm um, really, and I think we are all looking very much forward to have more exchanges, more learnings, and hopefully uh, some recommendation. I think it's really very timely and uh, tremendously important to talk about cultural heritage first in the framework of the European Year of Cultural Heritage and also in the framework of international cultural uh, relations. I also have a big pleasure to welcome two participants, two familiar faces, I would say, even if we have not seen each other for a while now, of the most thrilling activity of the cultural diplomacy uh, platform since it set up in 2016. In fact, our two guests here have been part of the Global Cultural Leadership Program, that is one of the program the platform is running. And this program, aims basically to develop fresh insights to international cultural relations practices and to enhance skills of cultural managers and to develop a kind of collaborative peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning. And also it offers the platform to uh, have uh, cooperation and to enhance cooperation at the global uh, level. So every year, 40 participants are involved in the Global Cultural Leadership Program. We have 10 participants from the EU and 30 participants from South Africa, South Korea, Brazil, Mexico, Canada, the US, Russia, Japan, China, and India. And they come very often from different fields of relevant cultural practices in their respective countries. And we receive almost every year about 1,000 uh, applications. And we select 40 uh, participants. And we had already one edition in 2016 in Malta. And last year, we had one edition uh, in, 2000, uh, uh, in 2017 in Athens. And also, I use this opportunity now to announce that the next uh, edition of the Global Cultural Leadership Program will take place later this year, end of November, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. And the call for application will be launched uh, early next week, I mean, early, early May. So today, as I said, we have the pleasure to welcome Ashwarya Tipnis from Ashwarya Tipnis Architects from India and Norton Ficarelli from Instituto Pedra in Brazil. And I think without any, uh, the way we would like to, you know, kind of run this discussion, we are going to watch uh, some short uh, movies, one from Ashwarya and one from Norton, and then we would like really to open the discussion and have questions from you, from the audience, to them. So if, if you are ready, we can launch the, the, the video. So my name is Ashwarya Tipnis. I am trained as a conservation architect, but I call myself a cultural diplomat who negotiates between the past and the future by using design as a tool. I have an independent practice for over a decade now been working on uh, urban heritage conservation. I work with heritage buildings. So I think I became 
Kalas Haveli. It will be gone into dust like other Havelis in Chandni Chowk, which I didn't want to do. I just wanted to keep it alive. And we restored the house with them living in the house for over eight years. It inspired many other people to restore their Haveli.
saying that if something is declared heritage it has to stay fossilized in time forever that there is no change is possible so we work in a climate such as that uh, to top it up with uh, people wanting to do things overnight like people want that project should just finish like that and conservation if you do it properly it takes a lot of time so that's the climate we work in and the second part to your question is as an independent cultural practitioner since i represent myself i don't work for an organization i think the challenging part is uh, of course there are many glass ceilings and uh, to be a woman uh, and to have your own practice and to get your voice heard is of course uh, one of the most challenging parts very often i get uh, people ask me uh, so what does your husband do so what does your father do nobody is really you know uh, i mean on the face everybody is yes very good very good but it's very rare that people actually accept that as a single independent woman you can do something on your own and the another thing i often find is that there is very little value in homegrown talent people want that you should bring in a foreign expert to tell you i mean this project that i was talking about the chandanagar registry building where we are going in for crowdfunding the government itself the indian government wants the french embassy because it was an old french settlement to bring in experts from france but the french government uh, was actually a uh, capacity building i mean i've been involved in the project for almost 8 years to you know to get the homegrown expert to now take charge but mindsets is what we is the biggest challenge for a cultural practitioner in india in my opinion uh, we i think what we're going to do we're going to come back to the audience for questions and answers uh and you probably would have a little bit i mean some more question to specify some aspects of the challenges you have just uh, mentioned uh can we go to see the Todo 
pessoas se adaptam ao, ao vale sobre o qual foi construída a vila. Né? Por isso, o terreno é, é muito lamacento, né? alagadiço, e, e a, as construções se deterioraram muito mais, mais rápido por conta da, da umidade. Enquanto a cidade se tornava cada vez mais segregada, com bairros para elite e bairros populares, a vila era um lugar de encontro social. Mas ali também existiam divisões que remetiam ao que acontecia no resto da cidade. A Vila Itororó hoje pode ser pensada a partir de uma perspectiva que compreende o patrimônio não só como algo que deve ser preservado, como se pertencesse apenas a um passado distante, mas também como uma ferramenta de transformação do presente. O projeto do Parque Itororó, assim como o da própria Vila, como tinham sido idealizados por Francisco de Castro, são pedaços de uma cidade que nunca se tornou realidade. Hoje, a vila é uma mistura de utopia, de sonhos, de impossibilidades e destruições que servem de inspiração e desafio para novos projetos de transformação da realidade urbana da cidade. Assim como a gente pensa em abrigar esses usos espontâneos, a gente pensa também em atender as demandas do bairro, atender as demandas dos ex-moradores, que, que sofreram uma injustiça muito grande, né? que sofreram uma violência muito forte é, no processo de Apropriação. A primeira atitude é, que houve é, nesse processo de chegada, de início é, dessa recuperação, foi exatamente abrir é, esse canteiro, reconstruir as relações sociais que estavam rompidas é, com esse território. É a tentativa de inverter a lógica das obras públicas que são feitas de trás dos tapumes e através dessa abertura do canteiro de obras, é, para que o bairro os ex-moradores e todos os frequentadores desse espaço possam opinar a respeito do destino desse espaço. A ocupação da vila, a produção de conhecimento uh, sobre a vila, a apropriação uh, desse espaço da vila, a reconstrução de sentidos uh, públicos para esse lugar, uh, tudo isso se configura dentro desse programa Vila Itororó Canteiro Aberto. A vila, agora em obras de restauro, está aberta para experimentos. Dessa forma, existe um diálogo inédito e necessário entre a arquitetura a ser preservada e os usos a serem inventados, a partir da história da vila. O casarão ele é tombado por inteiro, né? então não só a fachada teria que ser mantida, mas as casas não necessariamente seria mantida a tipologia. E, e hoje a gente, a gente determinou que, que isso seria mantido. Justamente porque um centro cultural ele não precisa se desvincular da ideia de habitação para abrigar atividades culturais. E algumas perguntas são feitas, não tanto na intenção de serem respondidas, mas para que permitam a constante reconstrução dessa vila que nunca deixou de se transformar. O que entendemos por cultura? Será que a cultura precisa de centros culturais para existir na cidade? Por que um centro cultural não pode ter moradias? Já que museus têm restaurantes e lojas, será que a moradia não deveria ser incluída nos programas dos centros culturais como um fenômeno legítimo? Manter a moradia não seria preservar a história do local? A Vila Itororó é um convite para pensar de forma concreta e coletiva a cidade que queremos. Uma cidade diversa, aberta, não pautada apenas pelo negócio, mas que possa ser o nosso bem comum, onde a cultura abraça e reinventa não apenas práticas artísticas, mas também o que entendemos por lazer, por meio ambiente, por moradia, por viver juntos, e isso não se faz sem convívio. O canteiro está aberto para isso. O tempo de restauração da Vila Itororó, se ele é material e se ele é simbólico, ele não tem limite. I think the 
first, we are only seven years old, the Instituto Pedra. Uh, Vili Tororo happened to be our first project. So our first challenge was to fundraise the first project so we could have a basic uh, administrative and technical uh, team. So after that, we could have other projects. And also part of this challenge was to select uh, like a, a small team, but very with uh, inter and interdisciplinary uh, skills and experiences, because we knew that the best uh, researchers or uh, archaeologists or whatever other technicians we would need for the projects, we could hire for a specific project, just like in this project, for example, we hired uh, many other people like curators and cultural producers. Uh, so we are a small team, but uh, very skilled. Uh, for the future, uh, now we are starting projects in other cities in Brazil, and the country is very big. So in Salvador, in Brasilia, in Rio. So now we have this uh, logistic challenge, and also uh, we must improve. We must we must have like excellent relations with our local partners and suppliers in these cities, so we can pretty much supervise what they do instead of always bringing our team to the cities we want also some local uh, development uh, so we are uh, very like doing our best to have uh, good local partners okay so you are doing a kind of uh, some capacity developing some capacity locally definitely definitely for example we have another project in a town like five hours from sao paulo and uh it, it, it's like an old train station that they want to make a, a cultural center out of it, mm -hmm. but we really have the feeling that they don't really know what kind of cultural center will make sense mm -hmm. for that place, similar to Vili Tororo's mm -hmm. challenges. Mm -hmm. So we are doing many workshops with uh, different institutions of the city, not only uh, for culture, but also for sports, uh, leisure, and entertainment. So they will use also that the same place. We try to understand more the territory than only uh, our cultural perspective, understand other ways to use the place, not only with arts and, and history. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience?
students who study there, the teachers as well as the alumni all love and it's become part of their DNA and the building is still unlisted or, and we got the UNESCO award for it yeah. purposely because it was an initiative that came bottoms up. So my learning really is community is any group of people who have a certain kind of an idea. It doesn't matter whether they are rich mm -hmm. or poor. This project in Vili Torora, the first thing we did is that people used to live in that place and it was expropriated by the municipality some uh, five years ago. Uh, so the first thing is uh, to call people who used to live there or uh, visit there to get to know how they feel, how uh, they see the, the, that place and what they want to do. So they used to have, uh, in Brazil we have in June, a very typical festival that a lot of different cities, uh, they, they do it. So in Vili Tororo, they used to do that festival. So we asked them if they wanted to do it again, bring it back, and they loved it. So they organized the festival themselves. We had only the support of the, like we have this big uh, warehouse that maybe you could see in the movie. Uh, so that was like one, one example. Um, after that, uh, also this uh, warehouse where we have our small offices, it's a big place. We did a workshop um, so we could um, build some uh, basic uh, stuff like uh, places to sit or uh, tables or places to meet where people could just come and do whatever they want, like being with friends, having a picnic or do some artistic uh, presentations. Then out of that, for example, uh, we started to have many groups of uh, circus coming to the place and doing their rehearsals, for example. Out of that, uh, they themselves, they did a circus festival and it was like uh, fantastically uh, well spread and then they did it again. So the strategy was to open the space and say everybody's welcome. And out of this, we started building some relations with specific people or specific initiatives and uh, other institutions. We also, out of that, uh, Goethe Institute was very interested in the, the project because we're valorizing pretty much the, the experimental uh, things. So we, are, we have a partnership with them for more than four years where we select also experimental projects and many of them made by people who used to live there or, at or just visit the place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah, please. Hello, my name is Ruba Saleh. I work for uh, Ishek Brussels Management School. And I would like to go back again to community engagement. And uh, not only you mentioned innovative uh, and experimental methods, and I would like also to go back to Ishrawa and ask if you both had any kind of digital technologies and innovative uh, engagement uh, tools in the community involvement process. Thank you. Well, concerning technology, um, we had, for example, one, we did a partnership with uh, Ferrara University from Italy. So we could do a three-day workshop for uh, 3D, uh, uh, I mean, a laser scanner, um, uh, how can I say, a research of one of the buildings because we, uh, we knew that it was the best way to understand the building. Uh, we also did a, one, a workshop out of that and uh, like people who were studying architecture could uh, join it. Uh, after that, we had another project with uh, the Municipality Bureau of Technology and we had like a, like a hacker uh, week, one week of uh, projects on uh, digital and, and, and technology. Uh, so it was also open for the, for the community, for people who used to who visit the place. Um, and also, well, well, just the basic, we have like a, a Facebook and um, uh, also a, 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 a Twitter where like people, yeah. they also share their stuff. It's open for, uh, it's not only us who uh, use it, uh, people from the community, they also share it with us. Thank you. Anyone? I think uh, my engagement with uh, digital uh, uh, tools for uh, heritage conservation was very
very much by chance. Uh, so uh, I've been working on this French heritage town of Chandanagar and I was commissioned by the French Embassy to do a listing of buildings of heritage value in 2012. We made the pretty report, it sat on many tables, nothing yeah. moved. So in 2015, because I didn't have any funds, I decided to put all that information online and we created the first website, it is called the Heritage and People of Chandanagar Project and uh, we worked with the uh, local uh, students who were studying history in the nearby universities to go home to home and collect oral histories and we put those up on the website. The students then started writing blogs and uh, so we, s we, and we also developed the technology in a way that people could, uh, you know, crowdsource memories about, uh, you know, the place and, and I think the lesson I learned is that while I was doing it, um, it was working very well, there was a lot of buzz, but the minute I stepped back and I thought that the community will take it forward, the website sort of, the traffic dwindled and you co need constant engagement even in the digital world to make the community, you know, interact with you. I mean, that's the learning that I've had from uh, using digital technologies. They work very well because they're very reasonable in terms of cost, but they need constant engagement and somebody has to foot the bill might be quite challenging. So the project finished in 2015 but I'm still paying for the website and I guess someday when, when I decide not to, the whole, the entire repository of what we've created online will just go away in a blip. So there's also this, this question about what happens to this digital heritage and this repository with changing technologies so fast. I mean when we were younger, three and a half pro floppy disks were everything and then now you can't even use them on a machine. So digital is, is we, we, I, I really call this, we flirt with the digital, but we don't know how it's going to go in the future. than to bring 
sorry, just uh, conserving con concerning what uh, you j you just said. Uh, something we debated very much in the cultural diplomacy in the event we both participated is that uh, developing countries and countries that have been colonized, uh, every time we talk about international relations, at least me and I believe her and most of us, the last thing we want is to tell what to do. Uh, actually, uh, we did want to have, uh, we really wanted to have a, a partnership with uh, Goethe, with the French Institute, with the Italian Institute, just because we love to interchange. We love, I love to be here and I love to bring people from anywhere in the world to tell me what they do and how we can help each other. I think I'll add to that. So uh, this year in January, as part of uh, Bonjour India, that was a festival of France in India, we had a co-creation workshop in Chandanagar where we had uh, 10 students of architecture from Lyon who came and stayed and worked with 20 students of architecture, design, history in Chandanagar. We worked on this one building that we are putting up for crowdfunding on what the possibilities are. So it wasn't just about a one-way traffic, but it was yeah. about uh, you know a, an exchange where where you where I think the French students also went back with an understanding of how the Indian context is and and how we do things differently because we have to do them very differently given the challenges of our context. So I think the point what Martin is also saying is that we have to be on the same platform. It's not about always taking, but it's also about giving. And that's what I think this whole global cultural leadership platform is has given us. The voice to even uh, talk about our experiences. Yes, exactly. I totally agree. Yes, please. Go ahead. Thank yeah. you. My name is Angela Moy from UN Habitat. But I'm speaking as myself, as an African, as a Kenyan. And um, my question is to Aishawara. Please. Two questions, small ones. The first one, uh, you showed us your video about the um, restoration of the personal houses. And I wanted to know who was a beneficiary besides the owner of the house for that restoration? I mean, how did it benefit the community? You said you even consulted the community and all that, but I, I, I didn't understand the community, the, the, the municipality, who was a beneficiary? And the second one was an interesting aspect you brought about um, doing uh, sending students out to speak to people to get their experiences. You know, in Africa, they say when an old man dies, it's like burning down a library because we are not a community that has written down a lot, but a lot of cultural heritage is spoken, you know, the anthropological part of it. And I wanted to know, how did you do it? How did you collect the stories? How did you store them? And I'm saddened to hear that there's a possibility that if you stop funding the website, you things will grind to a halt. But I think that for African context, things are not written down. They are told. My mother told me stories, it's not written anywhere. I tried to tell my son he's not interested. But you know we are dealing with, with <laughs> you know we are dealing with with a society that's changing, and if we don't document it, it's going to get lost. Thank you. So I'll answer your first question about the Havili. Now, uh, till this project happened, it was always institutions that were doing restoration projects. This was a project that was done for a family because, um, and the objective of the project was not restoration. In fact, the person came to me and said that he had three sons and he needed to get them married. So if I could spru spruce up his house, only on my site visit I realized that this was a listed heritage building. So uh, like I said in initially that heritage in India has been about freezing in time. So people have this uh, stereotype vision that if it becomes listed, they can't do anything. They can't live right. in that house. So the point of the project was to show that you can have a 21st century dwelling unit within a historic buildings that respects the heritage of that place. And uh, what we did is uh, we uh, invited a lot of students to come and see how work happens on site. The doors of the Haveli were open for anybody who wanted to come and see how it's done. We had a blog about the project and that was the first time people started having conversations. I got contacted by journalists across the not just the country but the globe wanting to see a real family and their stories to the extent that uh, it sent the message across to many other people that heritage homes are 21st century homes as well they are not museums that you can't do anything with and that inspired uh, again the National Trust uh, asked me to write a manual for owners and occupiers of heritage buildings so one little small project that was really done in a well made a 
big impact on how people think in the national capital and heritage homes are also heritage and they can take us into the future. And your second question was about uh, how we documented those stories. Very much it was literally about going to a whole town full of grandfathers and grandmothers, sometimes on video, sometimes they were not comfortable talking on video. So uh, the students actually wrote down those stories and then crafted them in the form of blogs. Because a lot of people are very wary of video. They don't want to talk on video. So we learnt these things, you know, as in through the dirtying our hands. <laughs>